We provide the answers and a better understanding of the world around you. Therapy came alive. We're going to continue talking a little bit about politics because we're two days away from South Carolina primaries. And with me to have this wonderful conversation is Dr. Jeannie Zeno. She's a professor of political science and international studies at Iona College. Not too many people know more than her. Dr. Zeno, welcome. How are you? I'm great. Thank you for having me. It's great to talk to you. Yeah, it's great to have you back. Um, this has been a heck of a time since last time we spoke. Boy, a lot of things have happened. We don't even have time. <laughs> this whole week to cover it. Yeah, um, a week feels like two years in this election cycle. I believe. Even this morning I woke up and already Trump arguing now with the Pope. It's uh, unbelievable. Yeah, what <laughs> he can pretty much argue with anybody, I think. Absolutely. So let's start off on that note. It seems like no matter what he does, it doesn't matter, does it? You know, at, at this point, I think that's been what we've learned. I mean, you think back to the comments he made early on about John McCain, to the comments he made about Latinos when he announced. I remember I was in New York City when he announced, and, you know, people in the press and particularly people in the establishment were shocked about the comments made about rapists. And I know this seems a long time ago, but it was his announcement. And he skated right through all of those. And not only skated, but his poll numbers went higher. So I think there, we, we started to feel like he can do anything and say anything, and his poll numbers will still go higher, and his supporters will be all that much more committed to him. Um, but I think after we saw what happened in Iowa, certainly he had a fabulous win in New Hampshire. Can't take that away from him. But after we saw what happened in Iowa and going into South Carolina, I don't know if that's still the case because the reality is the field on the Republican side, side has started to winnow down a bit. And what we're starting to see is that he is vulnerable on some things. Now, I don't know if his latest brouhaha with the Pope, for instance, will cost him some support, <laughs> but certainly the latest NBC uh, Wall Street Journal poll that shows Ted Cruz a little bit above him for the first time in South Carolina really does raise questions about not just whether he can say anything and still be, you know, this kind of uh, king that he's been, but whether, in fact, somebody like Ted Cruz or Marco Rubio can beat him on the ground. And we certainly saw Ted Cruz do that in Iowa. He wasn't able to do that in New Hampshire. But I think the big question in South Carolina is Ted Cruz going to be able to do that again and narrowly squeak by Donald Trump, who's had, you know, a really formidable lead in South Carolina for a long time. That's exactly what I was getting ready to say. You're, you're reading my mind like always. Uh, it, this time, it seems to me, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, of course you're the expert here, but Cruz did start moving up in Iowa, had the lead for several polls, and um, this time, it, nobody, it hasn't changed at all. It seems like poll after poll after poll has been the same. I'm going to go ahead and throw the, the Wall Street Journal one out for now just because it was a national poll and keeping it on the theme of South Carolina, but it was unbelievable. I just, I, I don't know. It doesn't seem like anything's phasing him. But here's an interesting thought I want to throw at you. Somebody was telling me there's been an evolution, as my producer mentioned, or phrased it earlier, in Christianity. Um, do you think that might be something? Are, are the Christians today different than the Christians maybe of 20 years ago in South Carolina and other states? Yeah, I mean, I do think and that when you look at the evangelical vote, which is what we usually call it, as you know, that it is a much more diverse population than sometimes it is given credit for. So I think that's where some of Donald Trump's strength has come from, is the fact that these are not single-issue voters. They're not voters who are going to only vote on, say, abortion. We know Ted Cruz has been hitting Donald Trump hard mm -hmm. on the fact that he used to be pro-choice and is now pro-life. But that's you know not the only issue that concerns evangelicals. They are concerned about a lot of things. They're concerned about the security of the country. They're concerned about their jobs. They're concerned about the economy. They're concerned about the, the way the U.S. is viewed around the world. I mean, I think they're concerned about a whole host of things. And I do think that it is a broader constituency in terms of the issues that they care about than we may have seen 20 years ago. And that has certainly played into Donald Trump's hands. And it is certainly something we may see in South Carolina. And you're absolutely right. I think you look at the real clear politics average of all the polls that have been taken in South Carolina, and we do have to give Donald Trump credit for being above, you know, in almost consistently throughout this, since he almost announced, but certainly since August, above any of the other candidates in South Carolina and most other states, quite frankly. But what I think we saw in Iowa 
Iowa was the fact that, and not just Iowa, but for a long time the polls have been wrong. And now certainly one difference between Iowa and, and South Carolina is, of course, Iowa was a caucus and South Carolina is a primary. And in the last primary, Donald Trump did very, very well, and the polls were quite accurate. We may see that again, but I think the big question is, any of this late-breaking information, any of this late-breaking news, what impact does that have, and how well are pollsters, and I am a pollster, so I can say this, how well are they able to read turnout? It is very, very tough to read turnout in any of these states, especially caucus states, but even states. So we never know. I mean, you think back to 2014, the polls were very wrong. You go overseas, Israel, Scotland. You look at the polls lately, and it's always an issue of being able to estimate turnout and then of being able to count and to really figure out what the impact of late-breaking news has. You know, this, this dust-up with the Pope, for instance, these kind of state, you know, uh, state of the union and um, the kind of debates they've been having late in the late before the election. Oh, the what town kind of halls. impact that has. So all of these issues can play in, and pollsters simply can't, you know, account for everything. That's yeah, that's yeah. We're asking a lot from the pollsters, aren't we? We, we want to be Nostradamus, and in this case, but I think it would be bad news for the pollsters if um, because the interesting thing is New Hampshire reaffirmed the polling, and yeah, I think you've surpassed some of the polls. But so South Carolina would be interesting to see how that does for the polling world as well. Uh, your job's on the line here, Doctor Zeno, huh? <laughs> no, you're absolutely right, and you know usually we would call North. You guys are up for victories as well. Um, two things. One of them is, do you think the, the, the evangelicals over in South Carolina, maybe some, you made some really good comments in regards to uh, they're not, they're more broad, they have more broad issues that concern them except uh, only, not only Christian, Christian issues, but also other issues. And maybe there's a little blowback from the evangelical community saying, look, we're not monolithic here. We don't only just care about Christian values, but we also care about foreign policy, terrorism, the economy. Is there a little bit of blowback maybe from those voters as well? Kind of a. I, I think so. And I think part of it is just like every other constituency, evangelicals don't want to be taken for granted by the Republican Party. They don't want it assumed, if you look on the other side, like African Americans, that, you know, whatever happens, they're going to be with the Republican Party. And I think certainly we've seen that in this election. And evangelicals are a, you know, constituency that the party has counted on for a long time. Elmer has said, regardless of who they put up, you know, they could put up a Mitt Romney, they can put up a John McCain, they could put up the most moderate candidates, and evangelicals would either stay home or turn out, but they certainly wouldn't turn out for the other side. And in a primary, groups like this or constituencies like this have the option of saying, you know what, we do have more choices out here, and we don't have to go with the establishment favorite. And I think we're seeing a little bit of that with somebody like a Donald Trump, and also, I think, with somebody like a Ben Carson, although he's obviously not doing as well as he was earlier. And by the same token, you look at the Democratic side, I think you see that with young people. I think you see it with women, certainly. And we have to see about African Americans, whether they are feeling like, you know what, we have options here. This is our choice of who we're going to decide to go with. And we're not going to be locked in to who the establishment wants. And that's really the benefit of a primary and caucus system, unlike what we used to have if you go back to, you know, the early 1900s even, or certainly in the 1800s, where party bosses were choosing the nominee, and then you were forced as a voter to either go with them, stay home, or go to the other side. Absolutely. We have about two minutes left, and I want to go to the other side. <laughs> the Republicans call it the, call it the dark side, but in regards to <laughs> Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton, this one is becoming quite interesting. Do you think it really is as close as it's starting to become? Yeah, I mean, if you look at polls, again, and that's a big if, because Nevada is a caucus state, and the Nevada is also obviously on Saturday, so we're going to see some of the polls and some of the averages have Bernie Sanders very, 
very, very close, if not within a point or certainly within the margin of error. And this has got to have thrown the Clinton campaign into kind of <laughs> disarray, if not frustration. But yeah. we've seen this all along, I think. You know, Iowa, he was way too close for comfort to Clinton's campaign, and, or to Clinton's uh, in that very narrow win she got. And, of course, he beat her big in New Hampshire, winning every single Democrat. The only one he lost narrowly with people who make over $200,000. And that's not a winning coalition, if you will, in the Democratic progressive left wing. I'm not sure at this point that we can say it's going to, although by all accounts, the polls still have her leading in South Carolina. Oh, that's right. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> How about the states on March 1st? Is she, is she leading there? She's still leading there. But again, I think, you know, we often don't think as voters about, you know, we obviously people are paying attention, but I think we don't really commit until much, much closer. So I think they have to be very frightened that as the closer they get, his campaign, Bernie Sanders' campaign, has really resonated. And it probably shouldn't be as much of a shock as it seems to have been if you listen to the media or listen to establishment mm -hmm. folks, because you go back to the summer and fall of 2015, and he had these enormous crowds with tons of energy. And you just haven't seen that on Clinton's side. And, of course, that means something. Now, whether he can translate that into a victory or not is a big question. She still has the advantage of the superdelegates, and she's got, you know, over 300 of those to his, I think, you know, less than 10 at this point, or maybe around 10. Yeah. But, you know, the party's going to be hard-pressed, just like the Republican Party, to go to a convention and nominate somebody, uh, you know, who is just not favored on the ground. You know, you could see something, I don't think we will, but you could see something like in 1968 where people are very, very frustrated oh. by the establishment. <laughs> Unbelievable, unbelievable election year. It is. It's really oh. unbelievable. <laughs> and you know, you and I both are just in love with it. <laughs> we could probably write a textbook about this one, can't we? <laughs> yeah, we could try. I think it would be very, very difficult to write it right now, though. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. We don't know what to expect one day to the next. Absolutely. And Dr. Zaino right now is actually driving to another interview. Amazing, amazing woman, Dr. Jeannie Zeno, Professor of Political Science at Iona College. Thank you so much, Dr. Zeno. Always great to talk to you. Thank you so much. Likewise. We'll talk soon. Take care. Bye-bye.